you too. Looks like we did make our challenge. Stay tuned. The Morning Mix is next. Welcome to the Morning Mix. This is the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. It's Friday, May 10th, 2013. I'm Mickey Huff in studio with Peter Phillips. Today we revisit untold histories of the United States as we play excerpts from the Untold History event, which was held at the Grand Lake Theater in Oakland, California, in February which included a discussion between Oliver Stone, Peter Kuznick, and Daniel Ellsberg. We'll also hear from Laurel Krauss, just back from the 43rd anniversary of the May 4th Kent State shootings, where Oliver Stone was a keynote speaker. We'll discuss the ongoing cover-up of that fateful event by federal, state, and university officials, and more. But first, KPFA News Headlines. Please stay with us. I'm Eileen Alfandari with news headlines. Landmark bipartisan immigration legislation emerged relatively intact after a first day of consideration by the Senate Judiciary Committee. The committee rejected conservative Republican attempts to obstruct a path to citizenship for many of this country's 11 million undocumented residents. New York Senator Charles Schumer is one of the so-called Gang of Eight Democratic and Republican lawmakers who crafted the immigration bill. We believe we have taken all the considerations into account and we have come up with a fair bill where no one gets everything they want. But at the end of the day, it will mean dramatic improvement for the American economy, for the American people, and will make our immigration policy much more in sync with what is good for jobs and America. The committee accepted 21 relatively minor amendments that focus largely on border security and increased congressional oversight. Critics say the border security provisions of the legislation will lead to increased militarization at the border. An astonishing story of survival in the deadly Bangladesh building collapse. Rescuers pulled a woman alive from the rubble today, 17 days after the building collapsed. That girl was all alone and using a small pipe, moving it like this. I told my colleagues, there's someone here. When I went there to hold the pipe, she said, please, sir, save me. I asked her if she was okay and if she wanted something to eat. After that, we gave her food. We made a hole and we got her out. The rescue gave hope to hundreds of relatives still awaiting word of their loved ones. Most of those hopes are likely to be dashed. The death toll in the building collapse has topped 1,000. Former, Guatem- former Guatemalan dictator Efrain Rios Montt told a court he never ordered the genocide of his own people. Rios Montt took the witness stand for the first time as the war crimes trial against him neared its conclusion. Nunca autorice. Nunca firme. I never authorized. Nunca. I never signed. I never proposed, I never ordered that there be any attacks against a race, an ethnic group, or any religion. The 86-year-old former dictator is charged with genocide and crimes against humanity for allegedly drawing up a counterinsurgency plan during his 1982-83 to rule that killed more than 1,700 members of a Mayan indigenous group. Prosecutors ask that Rios Montt be sentenced to 75 years in prison. One of the three Cleveland women held captive in a home for years as her five pregnancies ended after her captor repeatedly punched her in the stomach and starved her for at least two weeks. County Prosecutor Timothy McGintney said officials may seek the death penalty against suspect Ariel Castro for pregnancies that were terminated by force. Based on the facts, I fully intend to seek charges for each and every act of sexual violence, rape, each day of kidnapping, every felonious assault, all his attempted murders, and each act of aggravated murder he committed by terminating pregnancies that the offender perpetuated against the hostages. Castro's being held on $8 million bail under suicide watch. Minnesota's House of Representatives approved a bill to legalize same-sex marriage. The Senate may vote as soon as Monday, and the state's Democratic governor has said he would sign the legislation. Its author, Karen Clark, is the longest-serving openly lesbian member of a state legislature in the country. Minnesotans from every faith and political background 
have been urging the legislature to take action this year and include same-sex couples in the freedom to marry. I would say our Minnesota values are clearly not represented by excluding some people from the freedom to marry just because of who we are. The vote was 75 to 59. Republican Kelly Woodard argued against the measure. But we are redefining today in this bill a definition of marriage that has been a bedrock of our society for thousands of years. So if it weighs heavy on your heart, it should. Four Republicans voted for the bill. Two Democrats voted no. The vote came just six months after voters rejected a Minnesota ballot measure amending the state constitution and banning same-sex marriage. Minnesota would be the 12th state to approve same-sex marriage. Rhode Island and Delaware legalized such unions in the past week. The lobby for the oil and gas industry is pushing back against the recent announcement canceling all oil and gas auctions on federal lands in California until October. The Bureau of Land Management budget cuts says says the budget cuts were caused by the sequester. The immediate impact was to postpone an auction planned for later this month for leases to drill almost 1,300 acres of public lands in Fresno and Kern counties. The American Petroleum Institute objected to the decision, saying it will prevent economic growth in the state. The Center for Biological Diversity successfully sued over some federal oil and gas leases. The environmental group said federal officials had not adequately considered the environmental impacts of hydraulic fracturing or fracking. City officials in San Francisco and the East Bay rode bicycles to work yesterday to mark Bike to Work Day. The director of the East Bay Bicycle Coalition says 13 mayors from Alameda and Contra Costa counties participated and that Bike to School Day was bigger than ever. I'm Maureen Jarrett and I'm the parent representative for Safe Routes to School and our goal is to encourage biking and walking to school and active living basically. What's the sales pitch you'd give a parent who's saying it's so much easier to just pop the kids in the car and run them to school? Well, there's a lot of great cases, certainly the environment um, and some of the greatest amount of car trips are that short period of commuting to and from school. Well, I go to Berkeley Arts Magnet and I usually walk most days and my dad drives me other days and today I rode my bike. What do you like about riding your bike? It's fun because you get to feel the air on your face. San Francisco's Bicycle Coalition says a new record was set on Market Street on Bike to Work Day. The group says a manual bike count by municipal transportation officials at Market Street and Van Ness showed bikes accounted for 76% of all eastbound traffic between 8.30 and 9.30 in the morning. With a forecast for the San Francisco Bay Area, patchy morning fog and clouds, afternoon sunshine, highs in the 60s to 70s around the Bay, mid-80s in the warmest interior valleys. In Fresno and the central San Joaquin Valley, sunny, highs 85 to 90 degrees. I'm Eileen Alfandari. Be sure to join us at 6 for the Pacifica Evening News. Welcome to the Morning Mix. This is the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm Mickey Huff in studio with Peter Phillips. Today, we revisit untold histories of the United States, as we will, throughout the hour, play excerpts from the Untold History event that was held at the Grand Lake Theater in Oakland. Uh, That was in February. Oliver Stone, Peter Kuznick, and Daniel Ellsberg were in discussion that evening, and we have that for a premium for you today. Uh, But we're going to begin the program um, with a a very specific untold history. We're going to hear from Laurel Krauss. Laurel Krauss is co-founder of the Kent State Truth Tribunal. Uh, She's also the sister of Allison Krauss that lost her life. May 4th during the Kent State shootings. Um, Laurel also is co-author in the newest censored book, Censored 2013, Dispatches from the Media Revolution. Uh, I actually co-authored a chapter with Laurel on the Kent State issue that talked about whether or not this was a civil rights case, as oft it's uh, seen in history, or whether it was murder, particularly given uh, some new information that has come to light over the last several years. Laurel Krauss joins us by phone. Hi, Mickey. Good morning. Hi, Laurel. Uh, thanks so much for, for joining us uh, this morning. You were just at Kent State last Hello. week in Ohio, and I was wondering if you could give us a little bit of a background on what was going on there last Saturday, the 43rd anniversary. 
Uh, yes, I went to Kent State and traveled to there. I, I live on the West Coast. I traveled um, for the full event, which was May 3rd and 4th. Uh, they inaugurated a new visitor center at the university, um, and I got to witness it and actually was really de- devastated by what they d- decided to put before the public as truth. And uh, then we did the commemoration, and I staged a bit of a, a protest there. Well, Laurel, could you tell us a little bit about the, you just mentioned that it was a commemoration for this visitor center. So this is the next in a long line of attempts by officials at the university to attempt to address what happened at Kent State on May 4th, 1970. And you had just mentioned that you're disappointed about what this doesn't do. Um, and what, what's, what's lacking in your, your position here about the, the visitor center? Well, they, they spent $1.1 million on creating the visitor center. It, it includes very little truth. And I've been speaking with the directors over the last two years, encouraging them to cover uh, federal involvement, um, FBI involvement, COINTELPRO involvement, uh, the acts of uh, the FBI sniper Terry Norman, who created the sound of sniper fire 70 seconds before the command to fire. Um, this stems from our knowledge that came from a, a tape. It's called the Kent State Struby tape. A student uh, recorded what was going on at Kent State University May 4th, 1970 on a personal recorder. And that tape actually was entered into evidence by my father in lawsuits. Um, it was finally analyzed in 2010 and it came out with an order to shoot. And 40, 70 seconds before that order, four low caliber pistol shots fired by FBI Kent State sniper actually provocateur, creating the sound of sniper fire so that the guard could then, 70 seconds following, shoot at unarmed students, almost all of them more than a football field away. And this, you know, brought about the killing of four students, one of them my sister Allison, and wounding of nine. A number of the students that were killed were simply, you know, going changing classes. Laura, hi, this is Peter Phillips. Uh... It's Thank nice you. to have you on. I understand that Oliver Stone uh, was uh, present uh, at this weekend, and uh, what did he have to say about the, uh, these events? Well, um, Oliver Stone actually was the keynote for the opening of the Visitor Center, and he was beyond amazing. <laughs> he hit it out of the park for Kent State Truth, in my opinion. Uh, basically, he, he spoke uh, uh, beginning with the, the Cold War and the attitudes that we were um, fed uh, in, in fighting communists um, and then uh, went down the path of, uh, you know, leading to the Vietnam War. And um, his final analysis um, basically was, uh, you know, in, in line with everything that the Kent State Truth Tribunal has found, where, uh, you know, the Kent State Struby tape, the order to fire, uh, the 70 seconds before that, Terry Norman's handiwork. And uh, he he said, you know, I, I read about this story, and, I, and I've done my research, and I don't find it far-fetched. Do you? He said that the legacy of Kent State is blood. And that's not what the people that created that visitor center want us to remember. Yes, Laurel, that's a lot like, again, many of the other commemorative efforts there, ranging from the, the George Siegel sculpture on, on forward from the 70s. So this is a long time uh, of efforts to, to shape public uh, interpretation of events by the way institutions decide to commemorate them. And here, um, certainly, we, we wrote in the article, and you've been been looking for a long time, and, and now Oliver Stone seems to be saying that there, there there's definitely something else to look at at Kent State. In fact, it was a little over a year ago, we had you on the program with then Congressman Dennis Kucinich and uh, Stuart Allen, the forensic um, analyst. And th- this has been going on for several years now, and um, we hadn't seen much traction, but I think you have some news about uh, the Kent State case in the United Nations. Yes, uh, we have some very good news. Um, it, at the beginning of the year, we submitted questions to the United States, uh, the United Nations Human Rights Committee. Uh, they accept uh, questions for countries that they're going to be doing their analysis uh, review of. And in 2013, the United States will be going before the Human Rights Committee at the United Nations. The formal review will be in October. Uh, we've submitted our questions from the Kent State Truth Tribunal, and you can go to our website, by the way. It's www 
truthtribunal.org. Um, and the uh, questions that we asked related to excessive use of force, bl- police brutality, but most import- importantly, for what reason has the United States chosen to not investigate uh, Kent State when new evidence showed up? Uh, it's the statute of limitations on murder never lapse, and this becomes even more important because the United it, it's it's our fear and actually very accurate from from our perspective that the United States acting as a state government killed protesters on May 4, 1970, and they did it 10 days later at Jackson State as well. So those murders uh, 43 years ago are certainly not something that we want to cover up and forget about. This is something that is part of our history, and as, uh, as you say, Oliver Stone claimed, it was a bloody history. It was deliberate um, this wasn't just accidental. Uh, it's, there's all the evidence indicates now that there was some preemptive planning that went into this. Uh, Professor Elaine Willen, who was present that day, uh, is, has described how she observed, uh, uh, FBI agents, uh, in suits with walkie talkies, um, arranged for the burning down of the ROTC building the day before, which was blamed on students. So a lot of this was framed by the media, um, students uh, out of control, and uh, it was per- prescribed as, as a, some, so, somehow justified. And uh, the evidence today is that that's absolutely not true. Is that correct, Laura? It is, and and it goes beyond. Um, it's my, it's our feeling at the Kent State Truth Tribunal that they um, actually plan as they were planning the announcement of the Cambodian invasion. Um, they had been bombing Laos and Cambodia for a full year, but they needed to come clean because there were some media leaks related to that. As they were planning this announcement with President Nixon and his map and and all the rest related to the Cambodian incursion, um, they were also planning the Kent State and Jackson State domestic military battles to quell student protest and to make a very important statement that if you protest against the United States government, especially related to war, you will take your life in your hand. Well, Laurel Krauss, we're, we're, um, several years, as I mentioned earlier, several years past the evidence that Stuart Allen brought forth. Congressman Kucinich wrote the Justice Department. Uh, they waited a year, uh, before they got back to him and refused to look at the new evidence and basically said they were not going to reopen the case. This is what led you then to pursue what's happening at the United Nations. And uh, what, what do you believe the prospects are at this juncture? Um, wh- when do you see potentially the floodgates opening for the truth at Kent State, particularly after this uh, this uh, memorial, this visitor center that was christened last week? Well, the great news is the United Nations has already come back to me, and I have a consult that I'll be working on um, on May 30th. Um, this is a task force that's related to uh, the, the United Nations Human Rights Committee, and it will be held in Washington, D.C. Uh, they're going to be asking quest- uh, groups like mine to come forward and uh, meet with U.S. government agencies uh, and uh, to, to begin the conversation about what happened that day, Kent State, May 4, 1970, and what were the acts of the U.S. government to conceal as well as manufacture the murders and the massacres at Kent State and Jackson State in May 1970. So we're starting already in May 30th this month, um, and this will be leading to the October uh, 2013 formal review that the U.S. will go to. Every five years, every United Nations country does need to go before the Human Rights Committee, and 2013 is the U.S.'s turn. Laurel Krauss, uh, thank you again so much for taking time this morning for the update on what's happening with Kent State and the Kent State Truth Tribunal. Could you give listeners the website one more time? Certainly. Uh, we invite everyone to come and learn truth about Kent State. You can do that at www.truthtribunal.org. That's the voice of Laurel Krauss, co-founder of the Kent State Truth Tribunal, co-author with me in Censored 2013 on Kent State. Was it about murder uh, at Kent State in 1970, May 4? Laurel Krauss, thank you for joining us. My honor. That was the voice of Laurel Krauss. 
and she is part of one of our premiums today to you. That chapter that we were just uh, mentioning is in Censored 2013. That's the book that uh, I put together with Andy Lee Roth and the folks at Project Censored. That's available right now. Censored 2013, Dispatches from the Media Revolution for an $80 pledge. We also have, and we'll be playing excerpts of this for you shortly, we have the DVD of the Untold History of the United States event with Oliver Stone, Daniel Ellsberg, and Peter Kuznick. We're going to be hearing some clips there. You can get the DVD of that for $100 or just the audio for 60 But the bottom line here, folks, as you know, as we're in Spring Fun Drive, is that you support your local community free speech radio station. 800-439-5732 is the number to call, folks. We have volunteers waiting to take your pledges to support free speech radio here at KPFA. 800-439-5732. 800-439-5732. Online at kpfa.org. Peter? This is a unique event. This is Oliver Stone. Daniel Ellsberg, Peter Kuznick, talking about their book, The Untold History of the United States, and the the uh, Showtime uh, History st- uh, Channel story. And this is an amazing coverage of what we didn't hear uh, in the history books uh, in terms of U.S. history. It's, it's a, something that's a vital piece of everybody's library, a vital piece of things that we should know. This is where Oliver Stone, Daniel Ellsberg, Peter Kuzan talk about who really won World War II. Uh, why was the atomic bomb dropped? How might Henry and Wallace have made the difference if he'd been vice president instead of Truman? Um, what about how this all led to Vietnam and anti-communism? Uh, th- these are vital pieces of American history. Uh, this is a DVD Untold History of the United States with those, with Oliver Stone, Danny Ellsberg, Peter Kuznick. Part of this untold history that you can pick up right now for, by calling 510-848-5732 or 1-800-439-5732. The DVD is $100. The CD is 60 just the sound. And the Project Censored book, um, is at $80 with, with the Kent State chapter by Laura Krauss and, and, and Mickey Huff. This is the time to give us a call and support KPFA. These are premiums that you're, you're not hearing anywhere else. Project Censored arranged for these and brought these to KPFA. And this is an opportunity. Everybody was there that night, and it was absolutely packed. Um, you know, 600 plus people. Uh, if you asked a question that night, you're in this DVD. And, and it's really a vital piece with Peter Kuznick's speech, which we're going to play here pretty quick, and something to talk about uh, and bring forward and, and retain. That's right, folks. This is the untold history. Project Censored has been uncensoring uh, the media for 37 years. Oliver Stone and Peter Kuznick in their Showtime series, Untold History, go through 10 separate chapters. But this, folks, is something that you can't see or can't get anywhere else. This is a special event DVD. It was a Project Censored KPFA fundraiser, and we have it for you now. It's Oliver Stone, Dan Ellsberg, and Peter Kuznick in conversation about the untold history of the United States. You can get that DVD for 100 audio for 60 the Project Censored book for 80 Call in now, 800-439-5732. We need to get somebody on the line so that we can go and play this clip from Peter Kuznick so you can hear what he had to say uh, at that historic event. That was from February earlier of this year, the untold history of the United States. 800-439-5732. 800-439-5732. $25 gets you membership at KPFA. So any 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 amount you can afford to support community radio is always appreciated here, and we certainly appreciate it on Friday morning. We, we need to, right now, the, the lines are dead. And I'm not feeling very good about that. We need to have you help and engage and really support uh, Project Censored Show on Friday mornings, The Untold History, this DVD when we brought Oliver Stone, Daniel Ellsberg, and Peter Kuznick here. There's one line. Thank you. Um, this this is available here. Special offer to people on you know that support KPFA. Please give us a call right now five ten eight four eight five seven three two. We're going to go into into play that tape right away. But you need to call one eight hundred four three nine five seven three two. Support this work. Support this untold history. Support telling the truth um, in terms of what's happened in American history. Eight hundred four three nine five seven three two. We've got one person on the line. Let's have several more people join to support this untold history. You just heard an interview with Laurel Krauss, 
who was at the Kent State uh, commemoration last weekend. So we had an, an update report from her, who was, Laurel Krauss was just there. And that you're not going to hear that interview anywhere else. You're not going to hear that information anywhere else. And the uh, Justice Department doesn't want people to hear about what's going on at Kent State. And Oliver Stone is helping to try to uncensor that on History for Us. And right now, we're going to play a clip for you. But we need you to keep calling in, 800-439-5732, while we do that. Right now, again, earlier this year, filmmaker Oliver Stone, historian Peter Kuznick, and the Pentagon Papers whistleblower Dan Ellsberg spoke together at the Grand Lake Cinema in Oakland, the Grand Lake Theater. Here's a clip of Peter Kuznick talking about a largely forgotten figure in the middle of the 20th century in U.S. history, Vice President Henry Wallace, and how Wallace was dropped from the Democratic Party ticket in 1944, and Kuznick believes changed history. Here is a clip from the Untold History of the United States special talk at the Grand Lake Theater in Oakland. Peter Kuznick. One of the things we're doing with this project is we're trying to debunk certain fundamental myths. Uh, What we're doing is a history of the American empire and national security state from the late 19th century all the way up to the second Obama administration. And one of the big myths that we go after in the first episode is the question of who won the war in Europe. Most Americans, if you ask them, say, of course, the United States was the dominant force in winning the war in Europe, which is part of American mythology. Uh, The reality was that it was the Soviet Union who won the war in Europe that throughout most of the war, the United States and the British were facing 10 German divisions combined, while the Soviets were facing over 200 German divisions. As Churchill says, it was the Soviet army that tore the guts out of the Nazis. Uh, The Americans lost about 305,000 in combat during World War II. The Soviets lost a total throughout the war of 27 million. So uh, this is part of that history that, that needs to be known because it's essential in setting up the Cold War. Our second episode talks about the Cold War. One of the key things, the key demands that the Soviets were making when the war started, when the, after they were attacked by the Germans, was for the United States and the British to open up a second front in Europe to take some of that pressure off them since they were facing such a heavy German uh, military presence. The, the United States, in June of 1942, Roosevelt and Marshall promised publicly that we would open up the second front in Europe by the end of 1942. Largely because of Churchill, we don't open up the second front until June of 1944. By that point, the tide has changed militarily. So we talk about that in episode two. But episode three that we're showing tonight is really about the atomic bombing, the decision to drop the bomb, and the legacy of the nuclear arms race. What I want to do to set this up is tell you about one key person who we introduce who you, in the world episodes one and two who you not, might not know a lot about. Somebody who we think is a visionary, a hero, who's been lost to history in the United States, and that's Henry Wallace. When I asked my student who is Roosevelt's vice president from 1941 to 1945, they usually draw a blank. They don't know about Henry Wallace. Wallace comes from a distinguished farm family from Iowa. His father was Secretary of Agriculture. Roosevelt asked Wallace to be his Secretary of Agriculture in the first two New Deal administrations. And then in 1940, Roosevelt knew we were heading for a war against fascism and uh, Japanese militarism. And he wanted a leading anti-fascist on the ticket as vice president. And he asked Wallace to run as his vice presidential running mate. The party bosses didn't like that. Wallace was too radical, and they refused to put Wallace on the ticket. Roosevelt wrote an extraordinary letter to the Democratic Convention in 1940 saying that we already have one money-dominated, Wall Street-dominated conservative party in the United States, the Republican Party, said if the Democratic Party isn't a party that believes in social justice and progressive ideals, it has no reason to exist, and I'm turning down the nomination. I'm not going to run as a presidential candidate in such a party. He was serious. He drafted the letter. Eleanor Roosevelt went to the convention the first time a first lady ever did and made it clear that they understood that that was that he was serious. And they put Wallace on the ticket as vice president. He was again extraordinary. In 1941, Henry Luce, the head of the Time Life Empire, writes his famous editorial saying the 20th century must be the American century. The United States should dominate the world in every way. Wallace countered that as vice president, and he said the 20th century must be the century of the common man. 
He called for a worldwide people's revolution in the tradition of the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Latin American Revolutions, and the Russian Revolution. He said we've got to end colonialism, imperialism, economic exploitation. We've got to spread the fruits of science and industry around the world. We've got to raise standards of living. He called for ending monopolies and cartels. He subsequently said uh, that America's fascists are those people who think that Wall Street comes first and the nation comes second. Nowadays, we call them Democrats or Republicans, but Wallace understood what they represented in 1942. So in 1944, the party bosses decided they wanted to get Wallace off the ticket. Edwin Pauley, the Democratic Party treasurer, led the campaign. He called it Pauley's coup. Pauley was a California oil millionaire. He said, I went into politics when I realized it was cheaper to elect a new Congress than to buy up the old one. He later gets indicted appropriately, uh, but now he leads this attempt to get Wallace off the ticket and uh, to replace him with Harry Truman. Wallace, the night of the Democratic Convention started, July 20th, 1944, Gallup released a poll of potential Democratic voters asking who they wanted on the ticket as vice president. 65% said they wanted Wallace. Wallace is the second most popular man in the country. 2% said they wanted Harry Truman. But the party bosses had fixed the convention in ways that they can't even do nowadays. And so they had it engineered for Truman. Wallace made the seconding speech for Roosevelt the first night. The place went wild, a spontaneous demonstration for almost an hour, led by Hubert Humphrey and Adlai Stevenson. And in the midst of that, Senator Claude Pepper from Florida knew that if he could get to the microphone and get Wallace's name and nomination, Wallace would sweep the convention, defy the bosses, be back on the ticket as vice president. Pepper got within five feet of the microphone. At that point, the party boss was screaming, adjourn this session. Sam Jackson, who was chairing, didn't know what to do. He said, I have a motion to adjourn. All in favor say aye. Almost nobody says aye. All opposed say no. Everybody booms out no. And he says, motion carried, meeting adjourned. Pepper was literally five feet from the microphone. There wasn't a stage like this. They're on the same level. He was right there. If he had gotten five more feet and got Wallace's name and nomination, Wallace would have been back on the ticket as vice president. When Roosevelt died on April 12, 45, Wallace would have become president of the United States. What we're arguing here is that had Wallace been president instead of Truman, there would not only have been no atomic bombing in 1945, there might very well have been no Cold War. History would have been fundamentally different. And that's one of the themes we're trying to show, how close we've come to having a very different outcomes. That the, the history we have was not inevitable. And the history that we're going to have in the future is not inevitable. People can change history. We've come very close a number of times in the past that most Americans don't understand. So that's another one of our themes that we develop throughout this series. That's right. You heard that's the voice of Professor Peter Kuznick, co-author with Oliver Stone of the Untold History of the United States book. Also, the Showtime series, Untold History of the United States. And that was a talk from February in Oakland, California, where Peter Kuznick, Oliver Stone, and Daniel Ellsberg were all together. And we showed this episode of the Showtime series on the bomb that you just heard Peter Kuznick describing. And then there was a panel discussion between Kuznick, Stone, and Ellsberg, an historic discussion and a Q&A period where audience members were asking them various questions and they were responding. It was a conversation and a dialogue that you're not going to hear anywhere else. We have it for you today. We have a DVD of that evening's talk, Untold History of the United States, with Oliver Stone, Peter Kuznick, Daniel Ellsberg. The DVD is yours for $100. The CD only, $60. We also have Censored 2013, the book, for $80. Also, focusing on untold histories, from the more recent past and certainly from the Kent State shootings, and we talked to Laurel Krauss earlier, you can get the CD and book for 125 DVD and book for 165 But, folks, the most important thing right now is for you to pick up the phone and call 800-439-5732. Now's the time to support community radio. Now's the time to support free speech radio. Now's the time to support free speech and the right to know. Let's uncensor our own histories together. And this morning you can do that by calling 800 439 
five seven three two. Peter. Peter. Peter Kuznick's message there is that history is not inevitable. The more we know about our history, the more we understand the themes of our history, the untold stories, the Kent State truths, the truth about the atomic bomb, the truth about World War II, uh, about Henry Wallace and how we were manipulated, how powerful people manipulate us on a daily basis and try to cover up what's really going on. Those are the kinds of stories that we need to be told. Those are the kinds of information we need to have. And you can have this DVD set for, by calling 510-848-5732 or 1-800-439-5732. We need to hear from you. The board right now, it, it, I'm, not, I'm ashamed to say there's not a lot of lights on, and we've got all these great people in there volunteering to, for your message. And this is a message about democracy. This is a message about truth. This is a message about understanding what we are as an American people and where we've come from and how we, in some cases, we've actually been duped. And we need to know the truth. We need to know and untell our stories and reacquaint ourselves with what happened in our history. And you can help do that by listening to this DVD, by showing it to your friends, by picking up this CD, uh, by picking up the Project Censored book. All these are available for $100, $80, $60 pledge. Uh, you can pick and choose a combination of those things. 510. Call now. 510-848-5732. 1-800-439-5732. There's three people on the line. Let's get another, let's get ten more people. We need your help right now. Let's keep KPFA going. This is free speech radio. That's why we can do this. We wouldn't be able to do this on commercial radio. We couldn't talk about these issues. Those aren't allowed. But here we can do it. Here we can make these claims. Here we can tell these stories. Call 510-848-5732. 1-800-439-5732. That's right, Peter. This is this KPFA station, Pacifica Radio, and the Project Censored Show, The Morning Mix. We're about telling those untold histories. We're doing so this morning with Laurel Krauss, Kent State. We're going to play more clips from Daniel Ellsberg and Oliver Stone from the untold history here for you this morning. If you were listening even earlier, this morning and pledged and, and helped support KPFA, you heard an historic address by Noam Chomsky. If you were listening to Dennis Bernstein this week, you heard stories about Penny Pritzker, the mortgage, uh, the, the person behind a lot of the mortgage scandals and fraud that went on a foreclosure scandals that are going on. You don't hear that anywhere else, folks, but you hear it here. And we need your support by calling 800-439-5732. 800-439-5732. dollars gets you the Untold History DVD. $60 gets you the audio. $80 gets you censored 2013. But more importantly, you're a member of KPFA and the KPFA free speech community. You can become a member for $25, folks. Any amount uh, is acceptable to pledge here at KPFA. 800-439-5732. One of the community-related themes in U.S. history is is the dropping of the atomic bomb. Um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were the, were the only way to force Japan to surrender. <clears throat> now, and historians have noted the Japanese military was already destroyed, and officials in, in the government were prepared to surrender. Um, and but the U.S. would not agree to put the uh, not put the emperor on trial for war crimes. This is a clip from Feb, the February's program at the Grand Lake Theater, where Daniel Ellsberg talks about where he was and what he learned about the dropping of the bomb. The Americans had been led to believe that there was no chance that the Japanese would surrender. They were fighting suicidally in Okinawa and elsewhere. They showed the American public knew nothing of the intercepted communications that we were getting there, showing that the emperor was ready to surrender, basically, uh, if unconditional surrender were dropped and the emperor himself, the imperial institution, would remain. The American public had no clue of that. The people in the top of the government knew that there was very little need, probably, for an invasion at that point, and that they had, they had other alternatives. An odd thing was that in 1944, I was in the ninth grade, I guess, in... Um, school in uh, Michigan, Cranbrook School, and we had a social science teacher who was uh, relatively left-wing for the, the school that I was in, and had a, uh, uh, assigned us a essay project one day, which was, he said, there is a possibility of a U-235 bomb. Now, this was during the war. Manhattan Project was our biggest secret. In fact, it was the, the really beginning, in a way, of, of secrecy system for civilians in the country outside the military. And there had, however, been a couple of, of uh, stories during the war uh, 
about the possibility of uranium bomb that actually were thought to be great leaks by the FBI and were highly investigated, it turned out, but in actually uh, simply reflected the information from 1938 and 1939 that fission had been achieved, and they were speculations on this stuff. So he had just read an article on this, and he said, here is a bomb that would be a thousand times more powerful than our largest blockbuster. The question was, how would humanity deal with this? Would it be a good thing for humanity or not? We were actually studying a concept that was very uh, popular at that time in sociology called cultural lag and the notion that our ability to handle power and destructive power had not kept pace with our technical ability. Uh, we hadn't changed very much politically for a couple thousand years, but our technical ability to wipe things out had changed very much, and in, in other respects other than destruction. So the idea was, supposing then in that context we had a bomb. This was in late 44, as I say. Now, I think that we had a week to do an essay on that. And I think that every member of that class, and we were then 13, 14, you didn't have to be, as they now say, a rocket scientist, to realize humanity is not a species that can handle this. It's too much. This will not be a good thing. And the, the essence wasn't on who would control it. Would it be the Germans who had discovered the fission, actually, under Nazi Germany? Or uh, would it be us? But quite apart from that, whoever discovered it, would this bode well for humanity? And as I say, all of us 13-year-olds, as, as best I can remember, said, bad, this, this would not be a good thing. On August 6th, I can very vividly remember, I was standing in Detroit, my hometown. It's a very hot day. The streetcar was clattering past. As I read a headline, a single bomb has destroyed this Japanese city described as a military base by Truman, uh, the, starting, uh, uh, the first statement about the bomb being a lie by the president. And I looked at that headline and I thought, I know exactly what that is. That's the bomb we were studying last fall. And I had a very great feeling, of, an ominous feeling, when I heard Truman on the radio actually saying, uh, you know, the greatest scientific achievement in history, and we've done this, so we've unlocked the power of the sun and so forth. It seemed to me already from those six months earlier that there should be more anguish, more anxiety, and a tragic feeling in what I was hearing. And I felt worried about that. And the point I want to make here is simply this. You didn't have to be... Uh, any kind of genius or uh, especially wise or anything else to see that learning about it as we did in the fall of 44 before it was introduced to the public in the guise of a savior, a war winner the, the device that had saved so many fathers and brothers from death that had miraculously ended a war that the public saw going on and saved millions of lives, both American and Japanese. Uh, an American invention, not, a, not a anybody else. Uh, it was a, uh, when we studied it, we didn't know who would be the first to get this thing if it ever came about. No, it was American. It was started under the saint at FDR. In my family, uh, a saint at that point, many other Americans. There couldn't have been a way of introducing that bomb to the world, and to, I should say to Americans above all, to Americans, more deadly in its way, more legitimating of the use of that bomb. Imagine if, if, if Hitler, for example, had used it, had had one or two bombs, which is all we had, and used it on London or Birmingham, and something wiped out a city. The very design of the bomb would have been the first charge at Nuremberg for which scientists would have been hanged. It would have been stigmatized as a Nazi concept. Only the Nazis could do such a thing. How things would have gone, it would not have won the war. It absolutely would not have changed the uh, end of the war. The effect being then that we recognize something that to be punished, to be regarded, to be, but as it was, and here is where I am so much admire what you and what Oliver and, and Peter have done here in bringing this to the American public. It's not a story that's untold to historians. Uh, they know that. But the public at large, how many people really knew, even in this select audience, the, concept, the concepts that were presented there. The result was that 
there were really no qualms about going into an American-led atomic and then thermonuclear arms race uh, to expand our use of this weapon that had been such a savior of American lives. And so I say, uh, if you had considered it, I think almost anybody considering it six months earlier as a concept would have recognized it as what it is. Basically, Nazi concept of massacre as a form of waging war. That's the voice of Daniel Ellsberg. That was a talk given between Ellsberg, Peter Kuznick, and Oliver Stone on the untold history of the United States. That was from February of this year at the Grand Lake Theater in Oakland. We recorded that historic discussion, and we have that DVD available for you, the untold history of the United States, for a $100 pledge, audio for $60. We have more uncensored news and information in the Censored 2013 book. That's for an $80 pledge. 800-439-5732 is the number to call, folks. It is Spring Fun Drive. 800-439-5732. History matters. Where we've been informs where we are, where we're going, where we might go. A lot of the impetus behind the untold history that Oliver Stone talks about that evening and how this series got started in the book and so on uh, is uh, that, and you heard Daniel Ellsberg just now say it, these aren't necessarily untold histories to the people involved and to people that pay attention to them. They're mostly untold and kept secret from the American public, whether through the corporate news, government-managed news, cor- uh, corporate information, these kinds of filters that control what the public sees, hears, and ultimately thinks and considers. Well, we're uncensoring that history, folks, and that's what we do here at KPFA, round the clock. This is your source for information and community uh, community voice, and you can support it now by calling 800-439-5732. 800-439-5732. Peter? Our lines are open. We've got two people on the line right now, and democracy is about activism. You cannot be a passive um, democracy. You have to be engaged. You have to know what's happening in, in the world. So listening to or watching this DVD, CD, um, with Oliver Stone, Daniel Ellsberg, Peter Kustick about the untold history is a way of being an activist. As an activist, to call up now and call 1-800-439-5732 and, and support KPFA. Support that kind of democratic activism. This is the station that that is doing that. Call 510. 510- Eight four eight five seven three two. Let me give you an example. I mean, where else would you hear this announcement? There's a ride for reason tomorrow. Two hundred folks are getting on bicycles and they're going to bike from from Oakland to to Sacramento and have a rally at four thirty. This is support. Uh, the fact that California is ranked forty ninth in funding for K twelve students. So you know, get on a bike. This is an opportunity, and uh, we're, we're saying this, and people are going to do this tomorrow, and, and that the, the founder, co-founder of the ride says we plan to come back every year until this problem is solved. So you can check out Ride for Reason at com or call 510-459-4342 to find out about that ride tomorrow to support public education. But you can be an activist now by calling KPFA 510-848-5732, 1-800-439-5732. Let's light up this phones right now. We're going to play one more clip from, from Oliver Stone here, but uh, we want to see those phones light up a little bit before we do that. Uh, this is the untold history for a CD for $60. The... DVD for $100, the Project Censored book for $80, or you can combine the, the book and the, and, and the CD for $125. Uh, these are opportunities for you to know what's going on in terms of democratic process in the United States, to know our true histories, to really understand what's going on. And uh, we need your support right now, 510-848-5732, one 800 439 That's right. Remember what Daniel Ellsberg said in that talk that you just heard. If the Nazis had built 
and used a nuclear weapon, the weapon itself would have been denounced as a crime against humanity. Just think about that and think about how history is shaped and perception is shaped. And at KPFA, we deconstruct those messages for you round the clock. And we need your support now at 800-439-5732. This is why we need histories that are written to explain what really happened, not to justify the actions of the powerful. We need to get these messages out. We need to uncensor these histories. And we need to work together to have a voice that speaks truth to power. And that's what we're doing here now at KPFA. We need you to call in 800-439-5732. 800-439-5732. For $100, you get the D. DVD, Untold History of the United States, panel discussion with Oliver Stone, Daniel Ellsberg, Peter Kuznick, $60 for the CD, censored 2013 for $80. The most important thing, folks, is to support Free Speech Radio, 800-439-5732. Please keep the calls coming. We have one more clip we'd like to share with you, and we're hoping that it'll tease you into uh, really being curious. If you were there at the historic event in February at the Grand Lake Theater, that you remember, and you know what I'm talking about. But we recorded the event. We had the the help of Alan Reese and Ken Jenkins and some other folks and put together this project and Ken Jenkins is making the DVD available for us. Many thanks to him, but it's available to you from KPFA, Untold History of the United States, for a pledge of $100. And you can do that by calling now, 800-439-5732. Although nuclear weapons have only been used once in wartime, the U.S. has threatened to use them in other conflicts. And at this Grand Lake Theater event, during the question and answer period, a member of the audience asked the guests if they knew about U.S. threats to use nuclear weapons during Vietnam, the Vietnam period. And here were the replies from Peter Kuznick, Oliver Stone, who was in the military in Vietnam at the time, and Daniel Ellsberg. According to Le Juan, who was, uh, became president of uh, Vietnam after Ho Chi Minh died, He said the United States threatened nuclear war 13 times. So we repeatedly threatened to use nuclear weapons against Vietnam during that war. And if you look at some of the plans like Operation Duck Hook and some of the others, uh, Kissinger and others were were consciously considering and threatening to use nuclear war, nuclear weapons uh, in several instances. Oliver, I have to, we were talking just before this, and I learned that Oliver had been in Vietnam in late 67, early 68, during, during the Tet Offensive, actually. I was back in the States. I came back from Vietnam in 67. I'll bet you don't know, as part of the, the experience, the hidden, the untold history that you may not have learned. While you were being wounded in Three Corps in, uh, in January of 1968, Westmoreland had a study group uh, in I Corps, in First Corps, uh, looking at the possible use of nuclear weapons to defend, quote, Khaesan. As a matter of fact, did you know that? Or maybe? I heard about it, yeah. yeah. And, uh, nuclear weapons, if Westmoreland had had his way, would have been used while you were in Vietnam, as a matter of fact. Uh, that was, that's part of our common history, uh, that most, uh, that is definitely untold, uh, by most people. Westmoreland was the best looking, Dumbest son of a bitch general I ever saw. <laughs> that was Oliver Stone before him, Daniel Ellsberg before that, Peter Kuznick. They were all in discussion at the Grand Lake Theater back in February. It was a special event with Project Censored and KPFA. You can get the DVD of that event for a $100 pledge right now. We wanted to play a few clips of that untold history, remind us all of the importance of knowing our, our histories, and we'd like you to support this kind of programming and support the spreading of this kind of information. This is a great DVD to have for educators, to have in classrooms, libraries, to generate public discussions, and we're, we're making it available for you here. You can't get it anywhere else right now. Untold History of the United States DVD, Historic discussion with Oliver Stone, Daniel Ellsberg, Peter Kuznick. You can get it by calling 800-439-5732. We're coming into the home stretch here, folks. 800-439-5732. Online, kpfa.org. We need your help to light up the phone lines right now, people. 800-439-5732. If you support this kind of programming, shining the light on history, uncensoring our past, looking at underreported stories like we do here at KPFA, then we need you to show some support for that by calling 800-439-5732. Are you an activist for democracy?
Are you an activist for truth telling? Are you an activist who understands our history of why America, you know, has a history of people engaged, the Howard Zinn history of, of America, the Oliver Stone history of America, uh, the Peter Kussman history of America. This is an opportunity for you to pick up a DVD um, talking about the untold stories, these vital stories. Who won World War II, really? Why was the bomb dropped? Who was Henry Wallace? What what about Vietnam, and where did that take us into today's uh, understandings of, of where we are in the world? Um, activism means being engaged, and we ask you to engage right now by calling 510 848 Five seven three two, one eight hundred four three nine five seven three two. You can pick up the CD for sixty dollars, the DVD, the Untold History of the United States with Oliver Stone, Danny Ellsberg, and Peter Kusnick for a hundred dollar pledge. You can pick up the Project Censored book, uh, two thousand thirteen um, Dispatches from the Media Revolution with Laura Krauss in there talking about Kent State. Um, our lines are open. We got a couple on the line right now, but we got five minutes left in this show, and we need you to really step up and, and support KP and can really engage in, in what it means to be democratic activists. And, and I'm going to make another announcement about activism. And we've got the Occupy folks up in Sonoma County are holding a potluck and discussion on Monday night at the Unitarian Universalist Church um, starting at 6.30 p.m. And they're having author and professor Dr. Cynthia Kaufman is going to write about her, her new book, Getting Past Capitalism. So that's an, act, that's an activist engagement. And there's people doing this all over the country, all over the world, uh, trying to protect human rights, trying to protect our, our way of knowing and understanding to unmask the powerful and have them really expose the kind of manipulations that go on on our daily lives. And you can help do that now by keeping KPFA alive and Free Speech Radio alive by calling 510-848-5732, 1-800-439-5732. That's right. The Untold History of the United States DVD can be yours for the $100 pledge, 800-439-5732. This series and this talk, this historic talk at the Grand Lake Theater, is based on the notion of challenging the narratives of U.S. history that most Americans have been taught, right? We all know the the sort of whitewashed, top-down, censored histories that we've been told from Parson Weems, the early American historian lying about Washington chopping down the cherry tree, to you name it, up through the present WMDs, 9-11 elections, and so forth. There is plenty to unmask and uncover, folks, and we do that at KPFA year-round, but we can't do it without your support, and communities stepping up at these crucial times in our history when the voices at KPFA are needed maybe more than ever. 800-439-5732. 800-439-5732. We have about three minutes left, folks, and we really want to light up the phone room and show the volunteers in there this morning that they are are also appreciated because they're giving up their time to take your calls. And they'd love to hear from you at 800-439-5732. We also want to thank Flacco's, Be Healthy Honey, Cabot Creamery Cooperative, High Wire Coffee Roasters, Casa Latina. These folks and these businesses, these places in the community have stepped up and they support Free Speech Radio. Peter and I are here every week on the Project Censored Show with Andy Roth and other folks. We have the, the help of Kirsten Thomas. We have the great help of Anthony Fest who helps us every week. And when you call in, you show those folks that you're supporting what everybody's doing here at Free Speech Radio, 800-439-5732, 800-439-5732. Let's light up the lines if you believe knowing our history and an accurate history and a truth-telling history is important, folks, 800-439-5732. History is not inevitable, said Peter Kuznick. That means that we can make changes. There are opportunities all the time to really reshape where our country is going, you know, to understand the truth about Social Security. We're not, it's not going bankrupt. It's, it's there for the rest of our lives. They just want to move it over into the private market. Well, we say no. We say that we have to engage and know the truth about what's really going on and understand our history, where that came from. So part of this, you know, untold st history is understanding our rights and our, the people who came before us and what they did. And that's, you know, the history of unionism, the history of social security, the history of, of social services in this country and how they worked elsewhere in the world. You know, being having humanitarian concern for poor people is not wrong. 
It's the most right thing to do, and we have to engage and be in, aware of that. And that's part of our history. And you can support that history. You can support KPFA by calling 510-848-5732, 1-800-439-5732. Please give us a call. There's still some lines open right now. We're down to the last minute of our time here. Uh, the Project Censored show. Uh, Mickey and I got up at 5 a.m. this morning to come down here and volunteer to do this, and we want you to show some support for KPFA. 800-439-5732, the untold history of the United States. You can only hear it here, folks, on KPFA. The voices of Daniel Ellsberg, Oliver Stone, Peter Kuznick. Earlier in the program, we heard Laurel Krauss talking about the truth, at what went on at Kent State, and still trying to get that truth heard through the din of, again, all the voices of private power, state power, that are really trying to rain down uh, on, on getting this information out. They don't want this information out, and we want to get it to you. 800-439-5732 is how you can get that information. Keep the calls coming. As you know, Amy Goodman's coming up next, and she'll be telling you more that the corporate media don't tell you. You're tuned to 94.1 FM KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at